Chapter 48 The Festival of Passover and Unleavened Bread Deuteronomy chapter 16, verses 1 to 8 Observe the month of Abib, and keep the Passover unto the Lord thy God. For in the months of Abib the Lord thy God brought thee forth out of Egypt by night. Thou shalt therefore sacrifice the Passover unto the Lord thy God of the flock and the herd, in the place which the Lord shall choose to place his name there. Thou shalt eat no leavened bread with it. Seven days shalt thou eat unleavened bread therewith, even the bread of affliction. For thou camest forth out of the land of Egypt in haste, that thou mayest remember the day when thou camest forth out of the land of Egypt all the days of thy life. And there shall be no leavened bread seen with thee in all thy coast seven days. Neither shall there anything of the flesh which thou sacrificest the first dead even remain all night until the morning. Thou mayest not sacrifice the Passover within any of thy gates which the Lord thy God giveth thee, but at the place which the Lord thy God shall choose to place his name in. There thou shalt sacrifice the Passover at even, at the going down of the sun, at the season that thou camest forth out of Egypt. And thou shalt roast and eat it in the place which the Lord thy God shall choose, and thou shalt turn in the morning, and go unto thy tents. Six days thou shalt eat unleavened bread, and on the seventh day shall be a solemn assembly to the Lord thy God, thou shalt do no work therein. Deuteronomy chapter 16 Verses 1 to 8 Most persons reading Deuteronomy and the other books of the law for the first time are surprised, irked, or puzzled by the frequent repetition of law about the religious festivals. Two things, among others, puzzle them. First, there is the repeated and strong emphasis on the festivals. Second, people find it difficult to view them as festivals because the idea of a festival to them suggests almost a carnival. The festivals of the Bible seem to them very remote from a happy time. It comes as a shock to some to learn that the Scots, both in Scotland and the United States, came together, several or many churches at one time, to celebrate communion. These events were often preceded by many days of preaching and also eating together. The name for these events was Holy Fairs. Our ideas of a festival or fair are very different. Incidentally, festivals were common to the medieval church also. The history of festivals within Christendom and the West can be divided into three phases. First, the festival was a religious event, a holy day or days. The term commonly used was a holy day. The holy day was a celebration of the faith and the cosmic victory it represented. The Christian calendar celebrated victories of the faith. In the medieval era, saints' days marked God's mighty witness to the world in and through the lives of his servants. The holy days, thus, were times to rejoice in the victories of God's people. The Christian calendar reminded believers that the world moves to God's predestined purpose and that time manifests his saving power. Second, in time, the religious, or better, the Christian festival give way to a secular and status celebration. The holy days were supplanted by holidays. Days of national victories or deliverances now became important or more important than holy days. Each country developed its own canon of holidays, Bastille Day, Guy Fawkes Day, the 4th of July and so on. Man's joy and pride now rested in national achievements and men identified themselves religiously with their country and its heritage. The state had supplanted the church and the faith in the daily routines of life. The focus of life had shifted. The holiday meant national ceremonies and parades. Instead of the holy day governing the state, the holiday was now often honoured by the church. 
Then, third, the holiday became primarily personal. For example, Memorial Day is less and less celebrated in the older manner with the decoration of the graves of the war dead, parades and patriotic assemblies. It is increasingly a personal holiday, a time for rest or fun, partly because people are disillusioned with the state. Similarly, Christmas marks Christ's birth less and less for most people and is instead a family day at best. Easter celebrates the resurrection of Jesus Christ for fewer people and spring break for too many. The governing premise of the reduction of the holiday to the personal level is that the function of the ancient idea of festivals should be happiness for man. The happy hour in barrooms has its analogue in happy days for the people. Given this development in modern society, the idea of a godly festival seems strange and remote, as does the fact that such events were once a great delight to people. The impact on the calendar has been great. Instead of a Christian calendar, we now have one calculated to give men a long weekend and more rest or pleasure. Congress has rescheduled national holidays to give men long weekends. This is accompanied by moral bankruptcy and a loss of a true focus in living. The Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread were to be celebrated at the sanctuary. When Jerusalem became that centre, it meant a journey to Jerusalem. Since Israel was not too large a country, it was not a difficult task for the people to assemble there. This was done in the month of Abib, later named Nisan, each spring at March or April in terms of our modern calendar. The two festivals were really one. They celebrated Israel's deliverance from Egypt, as our Easter, Christ's resurrection, celebrates our deliverance from the power of sin and death. Passover marked also their adoption by grace into the household of God. It was therefore a family celebration together with all the families of the nation. They were the family of God. The Scots, until barred from so doing by a medieval pope, had a Passover dinner at Easter to celebrate the Christians' victory. The Passover was a celebration of salvation and freedom. In verse 3, the people are reminded of their deliverance from Egypt. Here again, we have an emphasis on memory. Remember the day when thou camest forth out of the land of Egypt all the days of thy life. Verse 3. People with no sound memory of the past have no good hope for the future. Having no sound memory of the past victories, they have no foundation for present and future triumphs. The festival was thus governed by memory and therefore by expectation. The loss of memory is a kind of insanity, because a loss of one's past is also a loss of our todays and tomorrows. There is another aspect to biblical festivals, and one which was once not uncommon to Christendom, the fast. The fast is a time of total abstinence, sometimes of partial abstinence from food. Fasting and prayer are commonly associated in scripture and history. The fast is, like the happy festival, related to the past and the present. It often means repentance for past sins, and, on other occasions, it means earnest prayers for present and future victories. The focus of the fast and the festival is on history and memory. The person fasting biblically is one geared to action and one preparing himself for it. Just as one loses weight physically when fasting, so he divests himself of the baggage of sins by repentance. Fasting and prayer means the active reassessment of one's past, present and future. This is why, historically, the confession of sins to a priest or pastor often led to the imposition of fasting as a penance. Its purpose was to reorder one's life and focus, to reconsider one's priorities and goals. 
At one time, American presidents set aside a day for fasting and prayer, and these were taken very seriously by many. The purpose was to clarify the national priorities and to cleanse its life. I can vividly recall fasting as a child as our family commemorated the massacres of fellow Armenians and set aside the price of the food to aid the needy. Festivals and fasting give more than a purely personal meaning to time and to history.